One thing that was stunning for me in your work, and I, I think I can say that without too much exaggeration, is how you use the, um, um, the three poisons in Buddhism to make institutional analysis. The, the greed, anger, and ignorance, which I believe you translate as greed, ill will, and delusion, right? Mm -hmm. Could you tell right. us a little bit about uh, how you use those concepts to make a, a wider um, social analysis? Mm. Well, the way that the Buddha talked about them, or at least the way that he's been understood to talk about them. And I have to make that distinction because when you go back to the earliest text, when I read them, it suggests to me that the Buddha, Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, who lived in India maybe 2,400 years ago, I get the sense he was a lot more progressive than the institution that developed <laughs> after he died. Okay? And this is kind of typical of religious institutions, isn't it? But if you look at his attitude toward women, he created the Bhikkhuni Sangha for nuns. His attitude toward caste, the way that when you joined uh, the order, you lost caste. I mean, he, he, he saw something more, but then the way the institution developed, they tended to understand it. Buddhism tended to understand our own dukkha suffering in the broad sense as due solely to our own minds and our own karma, our own actions in past. So... Buddha and Buddhism doesn't talk about good versus evil in the Abrahamic sense. Rather, what it does is the Buddha says, basically, if what you do is motivated by greed, ill will, or delusion, it's going to create problems. Right? But again, it was traditionally has been understood very much on the individual level. And fortunately, because Buddhism from the very beginning emphasizes impermanence and insubstantiality and is itself a good example of that, given the way that it spread, you know, from India to Southeast Asia to East Asia to Central Asia and now to the West. Uh, Buddhism has the potential to develop in response to new situations and coming now, not just to the modern West, but sort of modernity or postmodernity are now global civilization. I think it's very clear one of the challenges is that we have to ask ourselves, Given what we know now about the way institutions work, how they can cause suffering, what, uh, what, how do we need to re-understand those fundamental Buddhist principles? So very briefly, I think our economic system is really institutionalized greed. If you understand greed in the sense of you never have enough, well, that certainly applies to a lot of consumerism. But even more so, if you think about corporations, how they're never profitable enough, their market share is never big enough, their stock price is never big enough, national GDP, GNP is never big enough, you know. Why is war more and more always better if it can never be enough? It's this preoccupation with growth, which seems, which is now, it's pretty crazy, given that, you know, we're on a planet whose biosphere is not growing. And I think a lot of the ecological crisis can be understood as the kind of clash between an economic system that has to keep growing if it's not going to collapse, and basically a biosphere that can't essentially grow. I think that's the situation that we find ourselves in now. So institutionalized greed, our economic system, institutionalized ill will. Well, as a citizen of the United States, I don't have to look very hard uh, I mean, we could look at things like uh, our attitude toward refugees and so forth, migrants, but most fundamentally, our militarism. I mean, if you measure our military by the amount of resources we put into it, you know, this country is by far the most militarized in, in, in world history. And sadly, if you spend that much money on your military, you're going to have to find an enemy. You're going to have to fight a war once in a while, you know, to justify that. And it seems to me that's the kind of trap we're into. You know, we, we create enemies in, in various ways. And in a way, the whole military industrial system seems to need them. And then finally, delusion. Recently, you know, we're hearing a lot about fake news. And certainly there's plenty of that. But even prior to that term, if you look at the fact, say in the U.S., how um, most of the media are corporations, in fact, mega corporations, right? Corporations, they exist not to educate or inform us, but to make money. And how do they make money? They find ways to 
grab our eyeballs and sell them to the highest bidder. So they reinforce consumerism. They, they'll reinforce certain habits that will make people want to watch them. You know, so obviously they're going to underplay a lot of the problems, especially the ecological ones that tend to depress us when, when we uh, realize them. So in that regard, uh, I think we can understand the three poisons or the three fires that the Buddha talked about as uh, principles, fundamental problems that I think we now need to understand much more broadly than in his day. And that means we have to also find ways to address them, not, not just look to our own minds and how they work to resolve our own dukkha, but to look at the way that uh, the dukkha is functioning institutionally. I mean, one thing I like to say is I think socially engaged Buddhism in the U.S., uh, when it comes to individual service, maybe helping homeless people or hospice work or prison dharma, I think we've become a lot better over the last generation. We've become a lot better pulling drowning people out of the river. But we're still not much better in asking, why is it that there are so many more people drowning in the river these days? At a certain point, we have to ask that question. Yeah.